You can't hear me, or can you? Can you hear me? 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 えっと、小坂さんの声聞こえてますか聞こえますかあ、聞こえ、オッケー。あ、I Hi, I'm Yuko Saka from University of Kyoto, um, Japan. I'll be a facilitator in this lesson today. If you have questions, send it via chat, please. We have three papers today and only have 60 minutes, so um, let's just start with Professor Kinoshi. Is the moment when the atmosphere is light, originated in the participation in the natural school. So please. Hi, I'm Kyoko Shimashita from Kyushu University. I have a background in environment psychology, problems and questions. We are now starting the second session on East Asia, but it actually feels uncomfortable. This is because we doubt that we could be speak on behalf of East Asia, Japan, on topics that are more specific to this uh, area. In international context, the question is whether what we want to discuss is combating cultural topics as cultivated research it has already thematized a central subject maybe this the rethink of psychological knowledge and experience and practices of knowing that have been radically localized and personalized amid their histories. We want to discuss more deeply the meaning of inter interpreting and translating the world with words through reviewing how we have experienced acts of knowing. Hmm? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> A qualitative inquiry which pursues concern in environment as the Unit of analysis seems to require at least threefold interpretive aspect. A, 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 a understanding the meaning of something or event in the field. B, understanding the meaning through the experience near concept in the field. And C, linking the concept with experience power concept in wider context. Furthermore, another aspect of understanding, namely the aspect of translation, plays a very important role for us as psychologists from Japan. For example, this practice does not only mean expressing the meaning of something in different languages, rather it also implies a historical processes such as importing and appropriating the paradigm generated in the Western world. Said stated that the import importation from the, our attitude to sciences. Nakayama pointed out that the, in East Asia, especially in Japan, scientific thinking has tended to be accepted as dogma and fostered a submissive attitude because the framework has to be authoritative and, and firm. As a result, he also pointed out the tendency for scientists in Japan to be enthusiastic about solving existing problems and pay little attention to creating original ones. However, the adoption 
did imply maybe it's as to think of and overcome the academic situation because of the following backgrounds. First, it is a the interdisciplinary trends that occurred at about the same time and diverse locations, which may be lead to taking a critical attitude toward the conventional paradigm. Second, the trend puts a value not only on general and universal knowledge, but also on local knowledge. Finally, it rather focuses on meaning generated in the life world, which can be experienced and shared not only with dwellers, but with participants, outsiders, and guests or researchers. Perhaps the qualitative inquiry may, may bring about a second strategic revolution. Great pleasure to be here today. Therefore, in the present internationalization context, we need to think of the role and the meaning of acts for understanding in our fields. It's the above problem and viewpoint are formed from my studies on atmosphere, translated as hon iki in Japanese. My research field is everyday life in elementary school from 2001 to the present, one day a week. I have participated in everyday life in the elementary school as an associate member of, of the school, playing with children, talking with the teachers, and supporting classes. Where the atmosphere was sometimes questioned and found as something important for people. For example, we saw children having difficulty entering their classroom when they had to return to class alone. Also, there did not seem to be any specific factors that directly prevented them from that action. They experienced they, that they could not step into the room. Then we sometimes say the classroom atmosphere shifted their entering at the time. Like this, like this. While the atmosphere in the classroom is treated as either a serious cause or result of children's behavior, also treated as trivialities that do not require so much attention. If students attribute the classroom atmosphere as a reason for not being able to go to school, sometimes the teachers are surprised and disappointed at how weak minded they are. In short, the atmosphere has no substance, but we don't know well what we call atmosphere, how important it is for us, and how it relates to us. Psychological studies on, on atmosphere started at the Levin's essay, and then his group conducted experiments to it as a psychological phenomenon. It was still not a construct, but a naive concept. However, the atmosphere as an everyday term has disappeared rapidly from the mainstream of psychology. The atmosphere was explored. It is a focus on the technical problems, how to make it measurable, and was already defined as a construct that was static and substantive qualities of environment with several dimensions. Finally, the construct and measurement were import, uh, imported from America to various areas, including Japan. At this stage, they were uh, translated and, uh, and adapted so that they could be applied locally and spread throughout the region. Today, Japanese educational psychology has also accepted it. it because of its applicability, its critiquing and controlling it. Moreover, in educational settings, for example, in formal discussion for lesson study, the atmosphere measured and visualized by the scale, and its definition has been adopted because it is perceived as somewhat scientific. As a result, instead the fact that the meaning of the atmosphere in daily life remains unquestioned has been hidden, and the atmosphere which members refer to as the informal discourse 
in everyday life of the school has lost the opportunity to even be questioned what it is. In my inquiry, I tried to seek atmosphere which has sometimes worried by teachers and students in everyday life of the school. It's an exploration of how to describe and interpret it. And then it was clarified that atmosphere was often worried when a member experienced a crisis. That was when their presence in the school experienced threat in any way. It was also found that the atmosphere was understood as having a primordial nature of disclosing and revealing in front of us during the moment of the encounter. Strictly speaking, I, was, I still don't know the semantic difference between a similar amount uh, was similar to atmosphere. But the finding in the Japanese school setting reminded me that Raven standing on atmosphere has been closely tied to his life and his crisis. His essay in 1917 was about his experiences as field itinerary of the changing battlefield landscape and atmosphere than World War I. Raven's experiment research in the late 1930s was based on his anxiety over the changeability in the democratic atmosphere of American society just before World War II, shortly after he defected. Conclusion, the act of knowing arises from the expression of some, something perceived by the researcher as important in the field. The expression of understanding this world was may boom at the node between express what it differentiates from the world in the field into a concept in the discipline. In importation or translation process of uh, or academic history in the region, meaning are always defined as events inseparable from a certain field or situation. Therefore, they may lead to understanding phenomena through reflection between the meaning set with circumstances rather than through comparison with with words or phenomena. This is all for my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just go on the next. Go on to the next presentation. Um, Next presentation entitled Re Resistance to Authority, uh, Example of the Japanese Drawing. Japanese during World War II. Um, Professor Tsujimoto, please. Okay, share the slide. Can you see the slide, Hosaka Sensei? Okay, now let's start. Uh, I am Tsujimoto Masahiro from Tohoku University. And it is a great pleasure to be here today. The title of my presentation is Resistance to Authority, Japanese Cases During World War II. The objective of this presentation is to examine indirect resistance to authorities who commit inhumane acts. There are two ways to resist authorities, namely direct resistance and indirect resistance. Direct resistance is an act of openly confronting authorities who commit inhumane acts, as exemplified by protest demonstrations and strikes. Direct resistance may incur such penalty as social exclusion, arrest, and imprisonment. Indirect resistance, on the other hand, is an act of defying authorities who commit inhumane acts while making it a priority to not incur penalties. Indirect resistance in most cases is an act of false obedience that is secretly disobeying authorities while pretending to appear to be obeying them. 
few studies have been conducted on indirect, de indirect resistance to date. This presentation discusses the following four points. One, reviewing Wilram's experiment and elucidating what constitutes indirect resistance. Two, presenting cases of indirect resistance during World War II. Three, pointing out the efficacy and the limitations of indirect resistance. Four, examining the methodology in conducting case studies of indirect resistance. Next slide. Indirect resistance observed in an experiment on obedience. Milgram's experiment on obedience demonstrated that there are people who obey an authority who gives inhumane orders, and those who openly refuse orders from the authority. Some of the Milgram's experiment subjects indirectly resisted, resisted the authority figures although real attention has been paid to them to date. Milgram reported in his book, Obedience to Authority, that there were subjects who secretly tried to provide the correct answer to the learner while pretending to be obedient to the authority and those who continued to press the weak electric shock button while pretending to be intensifying the electric shock. Even when people cannot openly refuse orders from authorities, they can still undermine inhumane acts without obeying them through acts of indirect resistance. Now I present cases of indirect resistance. Evasion of military service. In this study, an act of avoiding a draft without incurring any penalties is defined as evasion of military service. Evasion of military service of this sort falls under the category of indirect resistance. Kikuchi reported some cases of evasion of military service during World War II, one of which is summarized as follows. Please read below. We take some time. Have you finished the reading? Let's go on to the next slide. The poet Kaneko Mitsuharu wrote how he deliberately drove his son to illness in an effort to let him escape conscription during World War II. Kaneko wrote as follows. Again, please read below. Is it okay? The underlined sentence suggests that Kaneko discerned that evasion of military service by many people would bring forth a great power. I will discuss this point later. Before World War II broke out, a large number of Japanese people immigrated to South America. 
Some of them chose to be immigrants for the purpose of legally evading military service. They did not openly refuse induction orders, nor did they openly participate in any anti-establishment activities, yet they avoided participating in the war. Now I present cases of soldiers not killing enemy soldiers. Soldiers not shooting or pretending to be shooting on battlefields are considered to be acting in indirect resistance. Some historical materials suggest that there were religious people who did not kill enemy soldiers on battlefields. A Christian who was oppressed for protesting against the war said to the authority, if the emperor orders me to go to the battlefront, I must go. However, even if I go to the battlefield, I will remain non-resistant. I will never shoot or make an assault. Meanwhile, the leader of the Japanese religious group, Omoto, is said to have told followers who were going to battlefields to shoot the air. Next slide. Olga Shohei had been fighting in the Philippines as a soldier towards the end of World War II. Sometime after the war was lost, he wrote a novel titled Kuryoki, in which he explained the reason why he did not shoot an American soldier he encountered. An American soldier walked up close to Oka, who had collapsed in a dense wood, debilitated by fright from enemies and malaria. The American soldier did not notice Oka. Oka pushed off the safety catch of his gun. But then he saw the rosy cheeks of the soldier. Oka did not shoot him. Oka explains that it was not because he had such a lofty ideal as love of humanity, but that it was actually a mere momentary fact that he renounced being forced by the state to shoot an enemy. Now I would like to discuss efficacy and the limitations of indirect resistance. To begin with, it should be affirmed that indirect resistance by many people can give a serious blow to authorities who commit inhumane acts. A multitude of people evading military service or not shooting on the battlefields will incapacitate the authorities' ability to conduct a war. Indirect resistance by a single person cannot vitally affect the authority and hence is criticized for not affecting any change. Nevertheless, indirect resistance by a host of people is extremely effective. However, indirect resistance has its limits. It is not feasible to bring down authorities who conduct inhumane acts solely by indirect resistance. Indirect resistance tends to be sporadic as a wrong act of an individual. In order to bring down an authority completely, it is necessary to organize a multitude of people and converge their power of resistance, which cannot be attained by indirect resistance. For the purpose of defeating authority figures, direct resistance is required in parallel with indirect resistance. Finally, I would like to discuss methodological issues. Do the cases presented here represent the typical cases of indirect resistance? To begin from the conclusion, there is no ground for asserting that they are typical cases, or I should say we should not focus too much about the representativeness of the cases in studying indirect resistance. 
I would like to explain the reason here. Indirect resistance is most needed in cases when people are ordered to engage in an inhumane act by an authority. I cannot contend for fair penalties, but I don't want to be obedient either. What should I do in order to effect a breakthrough in such desperate situations? We need a bold change in a way of thinking free from common sense or fixed ideas. The key to boldly changing our way of thinking is unpredictable cases. By learning about many such unexpected cases that we may never think of, we can come up with solutions and hampered by common sense or fixed ideas. In conducting studies of inject resistance, we should not care too much about the representativeness of the cases, but attach importance to the unpredictability of the cases. That's all for, that's all for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Tsujimoto. Can you hear me now? Oh, I can hear you. Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for your presentation. And finally, Professor Yatsuzuka, the paper title is Social Problem Caused by Discourse, School Bullying and Its Prevention in Japan, please. Thank you, Chairman. And good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. I am Yatsuzuka from Kumamoto University, Japan. In this title, I'd like to consider the significance of qualitative research and its connection with translation through social program, Bari, Ijime in Japanese, Bari. I wish to state these three topics in today's presentation. Translation or international comparison is itself a qualitative study. In some cases, we have to translate within our own culture. The essence of qualitative research is to provide a new vocabulary and interpretations to ordinary social issue. Qualitative research is essentially social action or action research. I'd like to present three topics today. One, is burying a unique social program in Japan? Obviously not, but there are deep-seated assumptions we Japanese still tend to think that burning is unique traditional phenomenon of our country. Two, in Japan, burning is social problem caused by discourse. We still tend to see burning as an unavoidable natural disaster, a tradition over which we have no control. Especially since the 2010s, the situation has become even more serious. Three, discussion practice, metaphor of the kaji, fire. I will introduce you an attempt of discourse pr practice on the bearing prevention in teacher education that is called metaphor of the kaji, fire. An attempt to reduce anxiety about bearing among students who wish to become teachers in Japan. Okay, now topic one. Is burning a unique social problem in Japan? It's a long time since that school burning became an international social problem. We Japanese discovered burning as a serious educational problem in early 1980s. Many children committed suicide due to burning. Until the 1970s, children's school violence and violence against teachers were serious social problems in Japan. The escalation of burning has sent further shockwave through Japanese society. Because of such historical background, many people, including researchers, recognized that burning was a phenomenon unique to Japan, deep rooted pathologies in Japanese education. Many commentators pointed to the culture of suicide and the close nature of Japanese society. Even today, Many Japanese still think in this way. Burying ijime is a phenomenon unique to Japan. 
However, at the same time, 1980s, bullying was a serious social problem in Scandinavian countries too. And many Scandinavian researchers were being conducted on the issue that were later reported to Japan. Unfortunately, such over situations are rarely introduced to Japanese society. Japanese have a tendency to think of bullying as a domestic original problem. Since 2000s, namely in the north of East Asia, mainly due to the rapid economic development and the heating up of the competitive education, school bullying has become widespread and turned into a serious social problem. Regrettably, Japan is considered as an advanced area in school bullying. But even more unfortunately, we Japanese have yet to find the suitable solutions. Some are trying to bring advanced Scandinavian programs for bullying prevention to Japan. However, serious attempts to deter bullying are scarce. We still see bullying as an unavoidable natural disaster, a tradition over which we have no control. We have to conclude that we Japanese lack a proper understanding of bullying. We Japanese are not able to understand bullying through foreign comparisons still yet. We Japanese still tend to think that bullying is unique traditional phenomenon of our country, of our culture. We regard bullying as an unavoidable natural phenomenon and only wish it would not happen. On the other hand, once bullying has occurred, we will thoroughly criticize the school and its teachers who has bullying occurred. This excessive avoidance of bullying is a hidden characteristic of the bullying phenomenon in Japanese society. Topic two, bullying as a discursive phenomenon. Bullying is, of course, a component of the group dynamics of the classroom in which children are embedded. Bullying always occurs when a group of children is stressed by a change in environment or relationship anxiety. The only way to end bullying is to remove the children's anxiety and reduce the stress. However, the phenomenon of bullying in Japan has become a problem caused by discourse that tries to position it as an inevitable and unique Japanese phenomenon. Bullying in Japan is complicated by the fact that the phenomenon of bullying is not discussed in appropriate way, not discussed in appropriate discourse. Of course, bullying became more of a social problem due to the discourse of the mass media and internet communication in Japan after 2010s. These macro discourses are to refer to the rare but serious burning case which brought suicidal victims and appealed to the emotion and indignation of the ordinary people. Namely, after the early 2010s, the topic of burning became to be talked in total with teacher bashing, school bashing, and criticism on the educational system in Japan. Unfortunately, the increase of discourse and concern on the school burning produce reverse situation. Teachers and schools, which are criticized intensely, get to become defensive and passive. They hesitate to become involved in small quarrels of the children and overlook the symptom of bullying, with the consequence that more serious violent cases of bullying occur around many school contexts. What is needed is a discourse that can appropriately refer to bullying. We must show that bullying is not a bizarre pathology unique to Japan, but a common and manageable phenomenon. At topic three, discussion practice, metaphor of the kaji, metaphor of the fire. Students who want to become teachers have reached a point of great concern in dealing with bullying. Some have even given up teaching because they are so anxious about dealing with bullying. I asked my class students to rate the anxiety and confidence in dealing with bullying on the scale of zero to 100 points. The results were startling and serious. So many students feel fear and anxiety for dealing with school bullying. 
this was an unexpected outcome for me as well. This is a result. So many anxiety and many students feel. This is an unexpected outcome for me. We must tell our students that bullying is not an incomprehensible phenomenon unique to Japan, but a common event that can be addressed. Bullying is a phenomenon that can occur anywhere and is not serious if handled early enough. Regrettably, teachers and schools are afraid of getting serious. They are afraid of being criticized. So they leave it alone and that's why they get into more serious situations that are irreversible. To show these two students, I decided to utilize a metaphor. Using the word burying, Ijime, it does not help us escape from this biased image. I suggest translating the word burying into plain another Japanese word, kaji, fire. Burying proceeds like kaji, like fire. That is to say, burying proceeds from peacetime, then occurrence, and get into severity. No fire is ever hopelessly serious from the start. Every fire occurs and starts from a small spark or trigger. More to the point, there are precursors to a fire, such as hazardous materials left unattended or abnormally dry conditions in ordinary peacetime. Peacetime, occurrence, and severity. And first, fires can happen anywhere. Fires occur naturally. No one is responsible for the outbreak of fire. But if we see the smallest sign of a fire, for example, small smoke or smell, or a call for help in peacetime, no matter how small, we must respond without fear of waste. The sooner the fire is extinguished, the less danger there is. But if we leave a small fire to fear, the danger will be greater. And above all, the best way to prevent fire is to be vigilant and call attention to people during normal peace times. The same can be said about burning. Burning proceeds like fire. That is to say, burning proceeds from peace time, then occurrence, and get into severity. There are no sudden and unprovoked outbreak of serious violence or suicide. Any serious varying starts with minor problematic behaviors at the outbreak stage. Furthermore, when varying occurs, problems have occurred in the normal environment already before, such as minor rule violations, small expressions of dissatisfaction, or relationship problems. I explained these contents and chats, peacetime occurrence severity, to the students who want to become teacher. That is to say, you do not need to be overly fearful and anxious about serious burning, but you have to deal with small troubles during seemingly uneventful peacetime. That's the best way to prevent serious burning. The results of asking students about their anxiety and confidence toward dealing with burning after this explanation are as follows. Next slide. Although even as never enough, I think that it has been effective in reducing anxiety and building confidence among students. This is a result. Of course, not perfectly enough, but I think I could reduce anxiety in students. Finally, I wish to state these three points again. Translating or international comparison is itself a qualitative study. That is to say, even if not directly comparative cultural research, the idea of translation is essential. In some cases, we have to translate within our own culture. Maybe our own culture, our language itself has an incomprehensibility that requires translation in many cases. And the essence of qualitative research is to provide a new vocabulary and interpretations to ordinary social issue. Qualitative research is social action or action research. Even pure research activities that are distant from social practice will always produce new vocabulary and discourse. 
I hope I could show some dimensions of the qualitative methods and action research from the viewpoint of translation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. As I already asked, if you have any questions, send us via chat, please. I will summarize three paper, papers and then give my very short comment on them. After that, as long as we have uh, time allows, we can have time for discussion. So I want to share this one. Um, Um, so this, this symposium aimed to discuss developing a new field for conducting qualitative research in psychology. So I want to focus on my brief summary on qualitative research and um, also our key concept for this symposium, um, interpretation and translation. First, the last paper presented by Professor Yatsuzuka was about bullying, ijime in Japanese. In this presentation, he mentioned we Japanese tend to think, or we should say strongly believe that this phenomena, bullying, is very special and kind of uh, inevitable for Japanese because of our cultural background or national character. Then we kind of give up thinking about it and surrender. Especially for training teachers, all they can do seems get scared of it or just pray for God never happened in their own class classrooms. But Professor Yatsuzuka tell them, don't worry, bullying is just like a fire. So once it happened, all you have to do is just put out the fire before it gets worse. Fire, kaji, is a metaphor for bullying by translating bullying as fire. Bullying, um, becomes something you can deal with or you know how to handle. This translation changes the discourse of bullying and that will change the actual situation, I hope. At least it changed teachers in the future. And next, Professor Tsujimoto's paper is about resistance to authority. Especially he was talking about in dialect resistance. Why in dialect? as he gave us several examples. Under the situation of World War II, young men were supposed to get into military service willingly for your own country. You were supposed to dedicate your life for your country, but there were some people who did not want to, and they won't resist um, directly with straightforward tactics. Then what they did was evasion of military service with underhanded way in sly manner. It was dishonest and sneaky way, but that's how we live our lives, I think. Maybe because I am also dishonest and sly, but we don't judge things always black or white, rather we judge, um, and deep meaning depends on each situation. That is interpreting situation from their position. And sometimes that position is not something you wish for, but you cannot change. Then um, you change your interpretation of the situation and then translate them to something different. As Professor Tsujimoto mentioned, what we need is to know there is a way to break through even if it seems sly manner. Once Mergram ignores those who take different reaction than others, 
nobody cares about those uh, minorities who shows what is called indirect resistance to authority. But now, um, Professor Tsujimoto tried to dig it out and let us know how we can get out. This is really good to know there were who resist in a way and also about how we also can resist. If we only pay attention to uh, majorities or try to find certain patterns, we look over these important and interesting interpretation and translations. Lastly, Professor Kinoshita, she is an organizer of the symposium. So first she explained our aims and, and then talks a little about her own research on Funiki atmosphere. Atmosphere is not something you can see or catch, just feel it or kind of know it is there. She tried to capture this invisible atmosphere. As you see, this challenge is almost the same as our all psychologist challenges. Try to catch the mind or psyche. And same as psychologists, people try to catch them by using operational definition. Also, as she, as she claimed that all those challenges are failed. Atmosphere is not something you can catch by given definition and cut it out from the situations. Based on her field work in elementary schools, Professor Kinoshita found the teacher as teachers, as professionals, uses or try to capture atmosphere by scientific scales. But in this, um, in their daily conversation, they use this, uh, the same word atmosphere in different manner. So we should see the background or um, historicity of their understanding or dealing with actual situation. That is their interpretation and translation as embedded in the situation or context. As described so far in the um, situations where people uh, position themselves, uh, doesn't matter they like it or not, qualitative research can show how that position can be interpret it in a certain situation. And uh, by translating them in a different way, we leave our daily practices um, by replacing them with something we, is a, we can deal with for the uh, individual agent. Thus, I um, thought that challenges of qualitative researches to explore the practice itself in which we are uh, shifting and replacing existing flames and also flames by which literature uh, ourselves being con constrained. In other words, we should not try to um, fit the flames available to researchers as operational definition. And we should not only look at interpretations, trying to understand how people in the fields give flames but also look at translation, how they shift into replace them for them to handle. Uh, <laughs> as for myself, my interest these days is child poverty and doing field research at a place where people support these kids officially. People often talk about responsibility for those kids. Um, is it parents or government's political responsibility, et cetera, that as long as we see, we see them from these frameworks, neither see a possible or a way out. We should seek for another way out by focusing and based on the way people talk about this issue and a certain situation. Okay, all um, papers are very helpful for me. Thanks so much. And now the symposium is uh, at in Squip. Um, we are here as Asian part. Um, well, day one is um, today is a plan for us. So we have another mission to position our work in the um, international competitive study. So may I ask some comment on this point for all the presenters? Well, first, uh, the same symposiums organizer, Professor Kim. Thank you. Um, um, 
question is internationalization of political psychology in an international context. As a main member of the Asian countries, we often might be expected to speak about our areas character, which was different from the other regions. It means that we have an assumption that comparing the West with the East, uh, or comparing countries with each other, lead to understanding as span it uh, as Yatsuzuka it is a clear case to view doing as a unique educational program in Japan. But I hesitate to follow the dominant stories like this. Through this symposium, we can think about the role of translation in addition to interpretation of the phenomena that remain unique and unquestioned in our daily life. Uh, and they are different from understanding through the comparison. Okay. Hi. So can you continue or answer uh, Professor Yatsuzuka, please? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, we tend to have the illusion that we are familiar with our own culture, especially in such international comparative symposium like this. I myself tend to feel like I'm representing Japan. I'm a position familiar with Japanese culture. I'm representative of the Japanese culture, but that is silly. That is that's a mistake. I discovered I myself do not know about all about Japanese culture, of course, and I don't know about the feeling of my students, the anxiety of the dealing with bullying. And to discover this, I have to take the route of translation or perspectives of comparative. That is my point today I want to insist. And uh, the point is also uh, similar to the presentation Professor Tsushimoto. P Professor Tsushimoto also say he, he discovered the universal things, universal properties of res resistance, I think. We focus on the action to anchor with was something which have been unquestioned when we can't encounter the events that meaning stands out in a set of some circumstances. It contrasts with the action of pointing out characters uh, which is found through searching the difference based on the assumption of comparable uh, structures. By the way, Tsujimoto-san Tsujimoto tried to capture actions that were not seen as resistance by using the term indirect resistance. Why did you decide to focus on draft avoidance and consider indirect resistance? Thank you for your question. Uh, when, when, <laughs> when I was twenties or thirties, I had conducted field research in South America on Japanese immigrants there. When I had conducted research in South America, a Japanese Argentine told me that. His father immigrated to Argentina to evade military service. Among Japanese immigrants, it is an open secret that some people immigrated to evade military service. I was very impressed with their 
ingenious way or brave. Is it okay? Professor Ginosta. Thank you. Um, we were just wondering why um, Professor Tsujimoto was get interested in, in dialect um, resistance. So that was maybe uh, some of the audience will be um, maybe um, in question that um, why he's interested in. But um, we only have three minutes left, mm -hmm. I suppose. So if there is any question that we know. But um, there's a question. We only have three minutes left. About um, Professor Tsujimoto, there is a question from um, I don't know on chat. Can you answer it, or if this phenomena can be viewed with a moral? Spiritual dimension. Can intellect resistance provide a cultural transformation? Tsujimoto sensei, chat. Okay, okay. I, I, I read now. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, it is very nice question, but it is very difficult to answer. Um, about first question. I believe, I believe that indirect resistance should be viewed from moral or spiritual dimension. But regrettably, I can't yet discuss this point, but I want to this point. This is future uh, study for me to elucidate this point. And to uh, the cultural dimension of indirect resistance, I think there are not cultural dimension. This is a very universal phenomenon. Uh, I want to discuss this point more if I can have much more time. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I'm so sorry that now it's time for our but Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for inviting us and gave us a chance to discuss it. Um, it was really, really a big fun, at least for me and great chance for us. We, we will continue to discuss over the, this topic maybe. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you all.